we had we had about verse um, sixty-three, six to four. When Zachariah, yes, Zachariah was about to name, they were about to name the child, and everybody kept an argument as to what the child would be named. And Zachariah found himself with the tongue loosened, and he declared his name shall be called John. Verse 64. And verse 65 says, Fear came upon all those living around them. And all these matters are being talked about in the hill country of Judah. So then, people heard what had happened, and it was big discussion, big discussion in the hill country of Judah, in the local villages up there. Everybody heard and talked about it. Um, it is normative and natural that people talk. They talk. Um, whether for gossip or otherwise, they talk. What was happening is that it, it seemed to have been such a miraculous thing. There are several incidents that caused it to look miraculous. But some of them are Her age, the age that they had to have a child. Another one is, yes, when Zachariah couldn't speak coming out of the temple. And then, now that the child is born, um, and Zachariah, being dumb for so long, suddenly starts to speak. And these are all miraculous in people's eyes, and it was, that they started to talk about it, and they felt that this child was no ordinary child. See, verse 66, all who heard them kept them in mind, saying, what then will this child turn out to be? For the hand of the Lord was certainly on him. And they are not talking about uh, Elizabeth's experience and Mary's experience when the child leaped. Nor would they have been familiar or understood enough to know that the Holy Spirit was on the child from he was in his mother's womb. This is highly unusual. Highly unusual. Uh, will the Holy Spirit be in anybody's womb now on a child? Why not? No, I don't hear anything from here. I need a mic. If you get a mic, I'll speak. Go up there, man. You might, might answer wrong. You tell the same no. Didn't say you. Uh, okay. Um, I, I say no because um, the psalmist who said, in sin, um, we, 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 we are of the sinful nature, sinful seed. Are you saying that John was without sin? No, John is not without okay. sin. Okay, all right, so go ahead with the psalmist. Okay, I'll I, I leave it there. Oh, I wait, you change I, your mind? I wait on the teacher now. Okay, change your mind. <laughs> Repeat the question, please, for the audience. Somebody want to. The question was, can anybody have the Holy Spirit from with birth? a child from pregnancy now? No. Why not? Because according to the scripture, the Holy Spirit baptizes us into the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. Right? So, that is not... I had the answer a while ago, now, but wait. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, Miss my thought. I miss my chain of thought. But but the fact is, 
the Holy Spirit baptized people into the body of Christ. That is not done at birth anymore. Was it be, done be, before? Neither before. You this see, is a unique what, situation. What, what is happening or what happens in the church today is that people take unique occurrences in the Bible and try to make it a general rule. And they try to stamp this on it. If God did it already, God can do it again. Of course God can. Will God choose to? No. How can you say that with such authority? Because the Bible says that. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit is given to us at the moment we believe. And we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise until the day of redemption. So then, for anyone to have the Holy Spirit, they need to be born again. And you cannot be born again Except in the womb of your mother. So what are we saying about John then? But he was filled within the womb. Oh, but that is a unique case. Oh, that's what I'm saying. That the uniqueness yes. of John yes. is that John came as the pre-runner, yes. forerunner to yes. the Messiah. That in and of itself is And miraculous. his job was to announce the coming of Messiah and the kingdom. John, that's why the Bible says, there is none other like John that was born of woman. But you know what is also instructive about it? And um, the whole idea of election. Um, the fact that God has that power to choose. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah it's just powerful chosen. right there. Yeah. But, but David yes. says from in my mother's mm -hmm. womb. So, yes. And the Bible says from before the foundation yes. of the earth. Mm -hmm. However, it is not till the enactment of faith that God will also bring that believers then get sealed with the Holy Spirit. Yes, definitely. See? And, John and, and, baby. and, 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 and um, when we talk about the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, believers were never given the Holy Spirit permanently. Believers were, where we get our word from, anointed, empowered for a certain time or for a specific encounter. Then the Holy Spirit left. Hence, David's cry. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. But David never had the Holy Spirit permanently to begin with. No believer in the Old Testament did. Hence, this is why the prophecy by um, Joel, that in the last days I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. See? It's a different um, thing. It's a new covenant. This new covenant is demonstrated by us being born of the spirit. So, which is spiritual regeneration, and we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. The moment we believe. So it's not a tarrying situation. Yet not nowhere in the Bible are we ever told to wait. And before anybody jumped to Acts and said, they were told to wait. It's a different thing also. In Acts, the Holy Spirit was going to come in a different way. In Acts, the Holy Spirit was going to work in a way that he has not worked before. In Acts, he was coming after Jesus left. Jesus said, if I don't go, he can't come. So here is Jesus leaving. Then the Holy Spirit will come because when he came, he inaugurated what? The church. So the new covenant began and the church began for the first time. Now in this new covenant, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. But there's nobody like John. John was unique in every way. His purpose was unique. And this is why even he recognized that when Jesus came, that he must increase and I must what? Why should he decrease? Because it's not about him. His purpose was to declare the coming of Messiah. Okay, with that in mind, let us look at what his father had to say. Verse 67.
and his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. He was what? And what is filled with the Holy Spirit again? He was under the control as according to Ephesians. Filled with the Spirit is not us running around and carrying on and making all sorts of noise. Being filled with the Spirit is indicative of the Spirit having control over us. Amen? So he was filled with the Spirit, Holy Spirit controlling him now, and Zechariah speaks, prophesies. And he's saying, and this prophecy, he's saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited us and accomplished redemption for his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us. In the house of David, his servant. And as we talk about David, look who comes. And it's not that one. So then, who is Zechariah talking about? Who is this prophecy? What is this declaration that Zechariah is making? Somebody should help him. We have a higher rung, say foot can talk. Yeah. Yeah, the, the higher rung is for the um, <laughs> for shorter people. So you can, if foot can touch something. Am I allowed to speak? Not yet. Okay. I just want to say good evening. I was in the clouds on my way to Tobago for a Bible study. But then, you know it go. The Holy when Spirit. You have a guest artist. You get a guest artist to pay him a big money. So this church paid me a big money to come back here. And so... I live seven minutes to walk away from here. I drove and took 15 minutes. <laughs> okay, so it's good to be with you. Sorry, Barry, for being late. Mm, that's, that's all right. All right, so now, who is Zachariah talking about? Jesus. Oh, you know that. Who, what, is, what is the occasion? Is it the birth of his son? There's a mic. I was, he, he, he mentions in 69, he has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of David, his servant. Um, David is from Judah and Zachariah is from Levi. Yes, that is a good observation and a good point. So then therefore it could not be John that he's talking about because Zachariah's wife was also a Levite. And the house of David is indicative of what? We don't want anybody walking around and shouting. We have a mic. You know that Jesus, um, the scepter, we speak about Jesus being the king um, through the... Uh, is you talking or are you talking to somebody? Yes. Um, to um, he would be reign on the throne... It's just a reference, the throne of David, um, in a sense, that he would be king. But it was, really, it was really indicative of the fact that Jesus is king. No, no, it's more than a reference right, to, to David that he would be king. It's from the lineage of David. The lineage, yes. There is a Judah. promise to yes. David that the king, that from his will come from seed, Judah. Yes. it will never cease. Yes, to yes. reign on the throne. Oh, yes, and Jesus would reign eternally, so it's, therefore, it's yes. Who would reign? We, reigns. Would, okay, okay. Reigns. Jesus yes, reigns eternally. Because Isaiah yes. has already declared exactly. of his kingdom there, there will, will be no end. Right. So the link there, and this is why it's so strong a prophecy, because they read it all the time and don't pay it any mind. He really is speaking about Jesus, who's not yet born. And he's using the occasion of his son to declare what is come. Is he using the occasion? Or is the Holy Spirit using the occasion? All right. So the Holy Spirit uses the occasion of Zachariah's son to
to declare what is to come. He raised up a horn of salvation for us. I have a question. Yes. Does that mean that when the Holy Spirit controls us, we have no say in the matter? Not if we are under his control. You have left everybody totally perplexed. Mm -hmm. if, if we are under the control of the Holy Spirit, which is what is indica in, indic indicated here, it is the Holy Spirit who operates through us. And we yield to him. Now, if we start doing our thing, then we're no longer under the control of the Holy Spirit. So when the Holy Spirit is in control, then the Holy Spirit, we move accordingly. This is why the Bible is so um, adamant that we must be under the control of the, so we don't operate in the flesh. So therefore then, it is still okay to say that Zechariah used the opportunity to speak of the Messiah. Well, he was prophesying. Through mm -hmm. the power of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, he has raised up a horn for us. No, he has raised up. Look at the, 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 the language that he's using. You know, he has raised up a horn in the house of David, his servant. As he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, salvation from our enemies and from all who ate, ate us. So there is a physical salvation that will come, right? To show mercy towards our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to Abraham, our father, to grant us that we being rescued from the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear so the removal of the enemies physical gives them the opportunity to worship without intimidation and without fear uh, in holiness and righteousness before him all our days one of the interesting things here, Barry, is that the oath that he swore to our father, Abraham, he doesn't say Moses. Yes. The Jews define themselves by the covenant with Moses. Moses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They were children of Abraham, but they define themselves by the covenant with Moses. Here Luke is going back to the covenant with Abraham. Yeah. And that is primary because Jew is not right. he's not writing from the standpoint of Jewish tradition and Jewish beliefs. Just like he goes back to the, to the genealogy to Jesus Christ from Adam. From Adam, right. You know, humanity. Okay. But, but, but then what he does with this, in going back to Abraham, he removes the necessity of the law yes. for salvation. Also remove the... Um, the requirement of, of being uh, circumcised. Well, that's part Jew. of the law. No, they, they call him when you convert to Judaism. A proselyte. A proselyte. He has removed that. He has now put you into direct link with the person who is to come. See, and this is what Luke is, Luke is emphasizing. Luke is not emphasizing the traditional beliefs and the, 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 the laws. Luke, mm. is emphasize, Luke is really emphasizing Beyond that, there is Jesus. And this is Jesus to all men. All men. But well, he goes back to Abraham. And why why say all men to Abraham? And women. <laughs> Especially women. Why we say all men to Abraham? Meaning all mankind. Why? Was Abraham the forefathers of the Jews? Or do we find ourselves... No, no, Mike, you went to say something. Yeah, Go because God made a covenant with Abraham. Mm. God made know. a covenant, but yeah. what did the covenant say that would include That's us? Well, Since it was primarily the Jews that Abraham. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. Um, that his seed shall be as 
this feet, this fence. No, that's numbers. That's meaning in physical numbers. How are we blessed through Abraham? I don't hear you. You have to go up to the mic. People and through me. your seed, all the nations shall be blessed. That's exactly what it is. Through his seed, all the nations shall be blessed. So we have entered into the covenant blessing, spiritual covenant blessing of the Abrahamic covenant. Not the physical one. So we don't go around claiming anywhere about, well, the Lord said, we're going to number the seas of it, sands of it, and, and, and the land is ours. No, no, there's no land promise to us. There is no land promise Well, the Jamaican men believe the, the seed parts. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, so, Zachariah continues. Um, so here, you know, notice, we shall serve him without fear in holiness and in righteousness before him. How long? All our days. All our days. All our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the... So Zachariah is speaking to whom? John. John. John, no. You, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. You will go on before the Lord to prepare his way. To give his people the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sin. Remember when John saw Jesus, what did John declare? You remember anyone? We read it in Matthew, I think. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Exactly. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So he's pointing to the need for salvation. Through Jesus Christ. So here it is that, that Zachariah is, is, is um, declaring that. That his son, his son will be the one that will go and prepare the way. To give the people the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their, of their sins. Because of the tender mercies of our God. So we receive forgiveness because of what? Because of our good works. <laughs> Which is what they believed. They actually thought they could work their way to salvation. Here Zechariah says, the mercies of God. Paul echoes that same sentiment in Romans chapter 9. Where he declares, it is God who will have mercy. On whom, on on whom God will have mercy. So mercy is not ours to give. And to dole out. It is God who grants mercy. And we are saved as a result of it. Which, with which the sunrise from an eye will visit us. To shine upon those who sit in darkness. And the shadow of death. To guide our faith in the way of peace. And the child continued to grow and become strong in the spirit. But he moved out. He never stayed home too long. See that? He lived in the desert until the day of his public appearance to Israel. By this time, I would think Zachariah would have died. They were old anyway, so they probably died when he was in the teenage time, and he would have moved to the desert. Is there a significance of him being in the desert? Um, I, I, I think there is, you know. I think there is, because he has moved from... 
well. To me, it is, it is, it is, he has gone in the desert because that's where the need was greatest for water. So it, it was, it had a, it was an illustration of Israel's spiritual decline, being in the desert. What is amazing is that they went. Yeah. I mean, who tell them same was down there? But, but we also have in the Old Testament, the prophets very often dwelling in places apart from the city, apart from where the build-up was. Now, Elijah was away. God appeared to him in the mountains or something like that. But it's interesting that in this passage, it tells about John the Baptist being the forerunner in a different way from Matthew and Mark. Matthew and Mark quote the Old Testament. Luke doesn't quote the Old Testament, but he says the same thing. Mm -hmm. Declares through a prophecy from Zechariah. Mm -hmm. And then he locates him in the desert, mm -hmm. which is the very same thing. The voice of one crying in the wilderness. wilderness. Mm -hmm. Prepare ye. Make way straight your paths for him, right. right? So Luke is doing the same thing, but not quoting from the Old Testament because he's speaking to Gentiles. Mm -hmm. The illustration is that Israel is now a wilderness overgrown and overrun with all sorts of heresies. And they have always been. That's why the prophets are always apart from them because they have gone in a direction away from God. the covenant mm -hmm. with God. Okay? Again, this is very interesting in Luke because in the Old Testament, when we are told that Israel has departed from the covenant, it's the Mosaic covenant. Mm -hmm. Here... It's the Abrahamic covenant, Abrahamic covenant. That, that Luke has in mind, you know? It, it's just very interesting. But, but, but that is that. so true because it is the Abrahamic covenant that establishes them as a people of God. Right. Not the law. Well, the law set them apart because the law gave them Sabbath. And the Sabbath was a sign of their... So to circumcision. And circumcision. But the mm -hmm. Sabbath became more of the sign of them as being God's people. Okay. But all of that is cut up by Luke here. Luke just bypasses all of that and goes right back to Abraham. So I think you're right. It's the Abrahamic covenant that set them up first as a people. They seem yeah. to have forgotten it. Clearly. Clearly. Uh, there's many, there are many things Israel seems to have forgotten and chose to remember. Um, Hearing it. Yes. Yes. So here he is in the desert. And he's preaching. And people are going in droves to the desert, which you will see later on. So, now in those days, which days? The days when all of this was taking place. A decree went out from Caesar Augustus. And that a census be taken on all the inhabitants, the inhabited earth. And what is a decree? It's an imperial edict or edict. Um, usually, a census is to register people for army. Yet the boys who are of army age to be registered for war or for taxation purposes. Depending on how many people here, then Rome know how much they ought to be getting from each area. So the, the, the census was for, for either of those things. Very likely, it served the purpose of both, especially with tax, because um, they would have had governors, and a lot of these governors are dishonest, and Rome would have to know exactly how much to expect. So if the governor don't raise that amount of tax, and they don't want to um, unduly tax them, when they don't have the people to support the tax. So Rome is not as bad as we make it out sometimes, you know. Rome is not as bad. Because Rome numbers so that Rome can determine, all right, how much we should get, how much tax we should get. But do we know why they were, why they were raising taxes? Anybody? Huh? The Roman Empire was always in war. So um, 
They needed money for war. Okay. Anybody else have any idea? They needed money for war. All is at war. They ruled the world. Yeah, so they, but, so, so they so, would have their what, armies in place. Yes, what Troy said is that they always had to be prepared. Yeah. Okay. Uh, they, so they have to have their armies right, prepared. Right. Rome, Rome constant, well, <laughs> they always had enemies anyways. But um, it said all the world, um, all the known world controlled by Rome at the time. Okay, okay so, so let me just give you a quick, because a little bit more than that though, Troy. A little bit more, so a little bit less sinister. But at the same time, very sinister. There's something called the Pax Romana, the Peace of Rome, P-E-A-C-E, -E, Peace of Rome. Rome ruled with an iron fist because they believed that the way to keep themselves in power was to keep insurrections down, okay, to keep the peace. And the way that they did that was to improve the roads. One of the ways they did it, apart from having a big army, okay, is that they they improved the road network and created a fast moving army that wherever in the empire you had an insurrection uprising then the might of rome would come down and crush them okay so they had to maintain the road network for one but also they had to feed their troops so apart from taxing physically taxing people that way the, the empire had the imperial edict that they could confiscate your agricultural lands, your produce, the feed. If there, was an, if there was an uprising in your area and the army had to come in, a part of the taxation was that they could just take away your produce to feed their soldiers. But it worked very well for good reasons in that the whole empire became relatively peaceful. There are still pockets of difficulties about the place. It became very peaceful and for the first time in centuries, perhaps the first time ever, it was easier and safer for someone to travel on the roads. And that will make it easy for Paul later on mm -hmm. to spread the gospel across the empire. Okay? So the taxation had a positive impact because Rome used the money you could see what they was doing with the money, even if you disagreed with it. And we're not saying that none of it, they were going in somebody's pockets. Of course, they had corrupt, corrupt officials. But they tried to use it to, to keep Rome in power. The peace of Rome, Pax Romana. We, we know, too, that um, the dishonesty prevailed because... Rome's taxation was like, as long as we get mine, yes, you deal with yours. <laughs> Rome's taxation was the. I hope none of you not in here. No, no. or you probably, probably today's taxi driver, who have to give the owner money. I was going like to say the conductor. I used to work at Stony Hill one time, and when we used to drive on the big SR fives and SR whatever, they're not big green bus them, and I would come out where I used to live. Get a bus, go, go to Stone Hill, jump on, on, the, on the step, and you hang off on the step because that's the only way you could get on. And I heard that a bus, there was going to be a, a conductors and drivers that were going to strike. And I said to the conductor, I said, Doctor, I'm not really a strike to see to them, man. He said, Strike for what? For money? I mean, pay myself, you know. <laughs> Anytime I want to raise up, people get raised up. <laughs> and that's the whole point. Because the, 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 the owner said, Bring $5,000 for the day. And then rinse the bus and make 10000 mm -hmm. and give the owner 5000 That's exactly what the tax collectors like Zacchaeus and, and Levi and so on, that's what they would do. It was horrible because there were Jews who, who sided with the Romans and then turned around and double or triple or whatever amount they could get on the taxes. That's what they do to earn their money. Okay? Okay. So, everyone was on his way to register for the census. This is not in today's world no, where something is required and people argue and tell you about them rights. You better right we go or else you're in trouble. <laughs> Everybody had to register. Everybody. So, and they were on their way to register when 
each to his own city. And the next line, now there was, a, there was something else. This was the first census taken while Quirinius. Quirinius was governor of Syria. There's an argument about that, that Luke might have um, made a mistake with the dating. There are, there are several answers to that. It, one could be that it's the second time acting as governor. Um, or, or, yeah, the first time when he acted as governor. Um, and then there is always the other one, that the, the term governor was a term that was used kind of loosely um, for people in authority. So it could be that also. Um, but there have been arguments as to the authenticity of the date, but it can be um, easily answered. I'm not going to go into that. Um, Joseph also went up from Galilee to the city of Nazareth to Judah to the city of David which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and the family of David now look at this this is Luke's first introduction to, 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 to um, Joseph. Matthew had a much bigger star in the world for Joseph. Why again? No, no. Why Matthew had a bigger star in the world? Yes. And the emphasis. Yeah, right. But Luke has no such thing. Luke is not even mentioning Joseph more than to tell him, say, boy, you know, oh, by the way, because he has mentioned Joseph, and it's not till verse 5 him even tell you, where he says, in order to register along with Mary. So he makes it seem as if Luke going to register here because Mary has to register down there. And then he tells you, oh, by the way, um, he was engaged. Who was engaged to him and was with child? Luke's first introduction. There's no emphasis on Joseph. There doesn't need to be an emphasis on Joseph. Because it is not about him. It is about the work of God the Father to bring forth his son into the world for the purpose of redemption. Remember, that's what Luke writing about. See? So here it is. Now, from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth, to Judah, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. What Bethlehem mean again? House of bread. Because he was of the house and family of David. So, in order to register with Mary, now why is Mary registering there? Because you're following Joseph? Yeah, she's a, she's a direct kin to David. See? And Luke says, oh, by the way, Joseph too. <laughs> you know. she's, Joseph is not the central figure in the story. Joseph too. But, but you know, you read this and you say, okay. And, and we miss the emphasis. Luke names everything from the city of Nazareth. Where's Nazareth again? Nazareth is in Galilee, up top. Yes. It's back a wall. It's real ghetto. Remember we talked about this where we said it was Galilee that, that they invaded from. And so the mix in Galilee they had more Gentiles there than anything. That's why the name also came Galilee of the Gentiles. You remember that? They one day when. when one, 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 one Christmas when we were preaching it. When I was preaching, I told you all of this information. Because we were emphasizing how bad Nazareth was. Nazareth didn't even have purebred Jews down there. Everybody just pull up the place. Jews themselves discounted Nazareth. But it comes up again. It's part of the prophetic word too. See? To Judah, to the city of David, 
which is called Bethlehem. Because he was of the house of God. Now, here's what you miss when you read this so likely. That this is an edict by whom? Augustus. Caesar Augustus. Who is Caesar Augustus? Emperor of the Rome. He of Rome. He is the, he is the most powerful man on earth. Who would that be now? We don't have the equivalent. Joe Biden. Joe who? Biden. No, I don't think. I, I, that, that is very debatable. <laughs> but, but, I mean, this is, this is without question the Putin. most powerful. Again, <laughs> I, I was going to suggest... Um, Andrew. The guy for... Um, <laughs> what name? Um, no, the guy who own... Um, Amazon. Oh, uh, Bezos. <laughs> Bill Gates. Musk. Who well, Musk owned? Amazon. No. Who owned Amazon? Bezos. Bezos. Let him have the richest black man now. Uh, He's now the richest man in the world. What Musk own? Tesla. No, man. I check it. I think he has risen above him. Anyway. This is a man of political clout and power. This is not just financial clout and power. This is political, military, might and power. When he talk, no dog bark. See? And here is this man who has nothing to do directly with Israel or the prophecies concerning Israel who is making an edict that is going to cause... The prophecy to come true. Micah 5 verse 2. When the prophets prophesied that it is from Bethlehem. You are the smallest of all of them, Bethlehem. You don't have word significance of mention. But it is out of you that he will come. And God is using the most powerful man on the earth to line up with his plan and purpose. You see that? And he does it all the time. All the time. All the time. In the Gospels, for instance, we see where he does the same thing with, with um, Herod's son who wants to kill the youth. And so Joseph gets up and with his um, with Mary and, and baby Jesus and go to Egypt to fulfill scripture. Okay? We see in John's gospel where the high priest very angry at the raising of Lazarus from the dead. You know? So you know what? What, what we just go kill the man and us done? It's better one person die for the whole nation than the whole nation die. Okay? Making a prophecy about Jesus and not even realizing it. So we see it, it's something all the time that we see in the Gospels where God is using anybody to accomplish his plan. Okay? And we should, we should have known that from a long time because in the Old Testament, the meaning was a donkey, the same word. So when God uses it, don't think of yourself too special. Uh, <laughs> not, not, not nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> nowadays, anybody, everybody have name and yeah. have position. Yes, yes. you're too special when God uses it. Because God can use donkey mm. and use heathens and all them things there. All right. So, God uses that. And uh, no, notice what he says. Who is engaged to he, who, Mary, who was engaged to him. Him who? You have to be reading all the verses to know who she, if she even gets. We know it's Joseph. But you know, he doesn't bring up Joseph's name again. To him and was with child. So he again outlines the fact that Mary is with child. But he doesn't make a connection with Joseph and the child. I told you when we did Matthew chapter 1 that the significance of the genealogy when it talks about the men tracing it got to 
Joseph, and then it says, Joseph who was married to Mary, what? Of whom Christ was born. And I told you that of whom there, the special significance of it was that what? First person singular, feminine. Which outlines that his only she alone he was born to. And here, Luke does the similar thing. Mm -hmm. Similar thing. Because he's highlighting that the child, uh, who is the significant one in the story, has nothing to do with Joseph. He has deliberately downplayed the role of Joseph. See? So, and she gave birth to her firstborn son. See? Not there, her firstborn son. Firstborn. Word there means the first of others. All right? It, it is not the other one that means the only son. There's another Greek word that means only. So it, it is indicative and it lines up with the rest of Scripture that Mary was not a perpetual virgin. Because Luke himself is going to use the other word to show you that it's not because he never know it, why he never put it there. You, you uses the other word in, to mean only child, like in 712. Can us write it down when you go me read it? The widow's name. Yes. Her... Only son. Son? Yeah, Mona Guinness, only mm -hmm. son. Only born. Yes. Yes, Mona Guinness. Um, 842 and 938. And that lines up with other scriptures to tell us that Mary had other children. Yeah, we don't even know when Joseph died. After Joseph fulfills his role of taking them to Egypt and bringing them back from Egypt, uh, with the exceptions of him going back to look for him when he was 12, I don't think there's any other mention of Joseph in the scriptures. It's not to undermine Joseph, you know. See? Because there's not much mention of Mary otherwise either. See? So, in Matthew chapter 12, 13, and John, not 12 verse 13, but 12 and 13, and John chapter 2 and 7, um, we are told that Jesus had half brothers and sisters. Why are they half? They didn't grow to full maturity? Uh, I don't remember anything. I can't even hear you. Joseph wasn't his, his biological father, you know, but they were Joseph's biological children with Mary. So mm -hmm. they would have been his half brother right. by virtue that Jesus is the seed of the woman, okay. not of. So, so, so the emphasis is really placed by people who read the Bible. In the culture of the time, there would not be an emphasis to say, "Well, Joseph had these, and these children belong to Joseph, and so Jesus is him half son, or is him stepson." You wouldn't. That, that is not an emphasis you would find in scriptures. That is not according to the traditions of the Near Eastern tribes. When a child was adopted, and a chi a chi an adopted child had great significance. Is here we think that children um, have a 30-day return policy. Adopted children in the Western world. Yes. In the Western world, you take the child, and if they don't work out, you can't back. You can't do that in the Near Eastern world. In the Near Eastern world, if you adopt a child, that child is yours for life. And not only is the child yours for life, because we have said that before, because sometimes when we read in the Bible that 
you, um, through the Spirit, have ad God has adopted us as son. We start feeling, boy, you know, it's just a little adoption. No, no, that's your Western mind. Adoption was an important thing. If you had a child and didn't want the child, all you'd have to take the child that was born of you, take him down to some refuge, um, dump heap or something, and leave the child. But you couldn't do that to a child that was adopted. Couldn't. Yes, you cannot. If you didn't want a child, you just take the child and carry them and leave them at the so refuge. So the one biological kid? No, yes. You could just take leave. him and put him. But the adopted you can't. child. It's called infanticide. And that's what made Christianity stand out above other religions after the death of Jesus. And following the example of Jesus and Lazarus, the parable of Lazarus. And even Lazarus, the, the um, friend of Jesus. Christians took it upon themselves to look out for the less fortunate. And so they created the first orphanages. They went to the dumb peeps and took up the abandoned children. So anybody could catch these little children and do what they want to do. Well, Pastor said you couldn't do that with an adopted child. You couldn't. The law wouldn't allow you to do it. So then, when you adopted that child, that child became one of your natural, like one of your natural children. That's why the Bible goes on to say, and if we are adopted as son, then we are what? Hears. And not only are we hears, but all the blood children, we are joined tears with them. So that when the Bible uses that, it emphasizes the significance of God having adopted you, will never lose you, or show you where, or go and leave you. You are his forever. Definitely have to go import something. <laughs> Praise the Lord, church. <laughs> and even then, them look at you. What's that? They cut them across them. Say it again. <laughs> Praise the Lord, church. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. What actually thinks that we don't really understand the significance of this, you know. Many of us here have been people who have been left behind. Constantly. You're too black. You're too red. You're too dunce. You're too ugly like your papa. You're too walkless like your papa. Whatever. Your head tough. That's the culture in which we grew up. So we don't count. Everything that you have can be used against you and is used against you to demean you. Okay? And to leave you out. And the scripture there is telling you the, I mean, and Luke's gospel, the emphasis is the very opposite to mm -hmm. our culture. And says so means to praise God. Praise the Lord, church. Praise the Lord. <laughs> 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 the pastor threatening to get some Pentecostal people to come to this church. <laughs> All right, Matthew 1 says that, um, that Mary was married, and people use this to say, well, Luke and Matthew not agreeing. But remember again, you know, the, the culture. In Matthew's culture, her engagement meant she was, that's why he said she was mature. It meant she was married already. As good as married in the eyes of the law. Except without the consummation. Right. Everything else, but yet it required a divorce. But Luke, that is not the culture Luke is writing from. So Luke could not emphasize the same thing. Right? And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloth. In swaddling cloth. Yes. Verse 7. And cloth was, um, this was a, a square piece of cloth. Much like how you see nappies now. And they would lie the baby on the square piece of cloth. And it would have from one corner uh, like a bandage coming down. And um, they would then put the baby on the square corner, fold it over, and wrap the baby in the entire thing. I was reading the other day of the, the impact, the, 
the, the significance and how it was helpful to mothers then. I, I don't remember what I read, so I can't tell you anything. <laughs> no, but I did know that, and, you know, but a lot of things that they practiced then, especially in Israel, had health benefits. But we see some similar things today in that we keep babies warm. Yeah. You know, hot, hot Jamaica, we still keep babies warm. So we wrap them up, not true? Yeah. And things like that. Them know because them have sister and them have niece them and nephew children. and all them things. Them know them have friends who have picked it. It's all right. Here it is now. And she gave birth to her firstborn and she wrapped the cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now, what is a manger? A manger is a place um, where animals feed. Or it might just have been a place to keep them. A feeding trough. It could be a trough. feeding trough or it could have been a stable. Either way. Right. Either way. Right? And how an inn operated was, there was an inn was like some open stalls. Might I say, though, by before we get there, that there's a problem in this verse. Your translation you just have, there was no room for them in the inn. It's an incorrect translation. Okay? The better translation is that there was no place for them in the room. And that raises a lot of questions. The word tapas is place. King James translates tapas as room. Okay? And the last word that is translated in is the same word that is translated room. Luke uses it. Luke uses that word for the upper room when Jesus sent the disciples to go mm -hmm. and have the room prepared. And he uses a word for in in the parable of the Good Samaritan. Okay? When the Good Samaritan goes to the innkeeper, and it's a different word from the word in Luke. Chapter 2, that the King James translates as in. So it raises a, a difficulty. And the difficulty is there is no room, there is no place for them in the room. Not an inn. No place for them. What room is Luke speaking about? That's where the difficulty is. This is because what we have in our minds is something like this. This is where we've have, we have heard it. I don't know, I don't know what Barry prepared. And I might short circuit him, short circuit his preparation here. I might conk me, conk me in my head after. I don't know. But what we have in our mind in our very touristy oriented yeah. Jamaica is a hotel. Is a hotel. Like a motel. And when because of the census taking place, there are so many people coming to Bethlehem that the place pack out. And so here comes this people can't get any place to stay and they go to the motel or hotel and there's no room. So what the hotel manager do is the next best and give them the, the stall for the animals where they can go and have their children. Okay? That has become such an ingrained understanding of the passage by us that we can't think of anything different. Okay? So the question is, which room does Luke have in mind when he says that there is no place for them in the room? Anybody have any suggestions? Nobody? Look for a clue. There must be a clue somewhere earlier on in the passage. Anybody find that? Give you, give you my soup later. Any soup here later, by the way? You can have enough fine and time when you go down first. I can't go and read. Why are they going to Bethlehem again? But why register their why? Yes. They were of the lineage, their, their family come from there. So the best understanding is that people who are coming in would stay with family. Okay? So there is no room, no place for them in the room. What room? 
the culture of hospitality meant that when family members came, you gave them your best room, your big room. But there's no place for them in the room. Why is there no place for them in the room? No, look again, man. Oh, good. There's a better clue. More in keeping with, 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 with Luke's emphasis. Because Mary pregnant and something else. And then and she's not married. Yes, I'm going to suggest that is so. Okay. That's a suggestion. I'm suggesting that Please this is do so. Do not walk away and say. I am telling you. The Bible says so. My understanding is better than the traditional understanding. <laughs> He's coming to family. When my family come from Montego Bay, come here. When my auntie and, and my cousin and come from Montego Bay, come to town. Anywhere in the house, they can stay. They must stay. And what it usually meant is that. My mother give up the bedroom and make Paul or whoever has come from Montego Bay stay at the room there. Okay, that's how we understand hospitality, and we were not even half as hospitable as them. So the question is, why can't they find a family home to stay? Okay, and the suggestion is that in religious Bethlehem, here comes this young couple. Not yet fully married, but the girl pregnant. Don't run with that. Okay, I'm telling you, go and All read right. for yourself. It, it, it is, it is, it, it, it. Read for All yourself. it is, is a suggestion. All right? Now, you can hold to it if you want to. Read it. All I'm but, saying, but do not don't say hold it, it because Bible David says say so. Okay. Don't All hold right. it because David said that. All right. Hold to it because you read and you see the background material that you see that the traditional translation is a bad translation. Okay? It's a bad translation. Anyway, um, the idea is novel at the very least. It's novel to you, Barry, because you first It's novel age. at the very <laughs> least, but it doesn't mean that that is so. Go on. Right. Check it, though. Check it, though. All right. If, but if I'm right, you see, friends, it is very in keeping with Luke about people at the very bottom of the rung being elevated. It could also mean, right. especially in light of that um, thing, is that, which we will discover sooner or later, that they were so poor... That their family there would not want or did not provide for them, but provide for, as you say, those who were more elevated in terms of finance. Mm -hmm. So it can run that way too, or it can run that they, when they got to where they were, placed in full. But it, we, we get that idea, Barry. My point is that we get that idea from the translation says, that says in, mm -hmm. and the word for in doesn't appear in the passage. Mm -hmm. It doesn't Different happen. word, but... Um, totally, a, a word that is not used as in anywhere else in the scriptures. There's a translation or an interpretation by the King James Version's translators. Well, they use their culture to, 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 to interpret the verse, and then we have followed suit ever since. And it fits perfectly in our understanding of hotel culture in Jamaica. So we have just continued it all. But when you check it out, the word for in in the Greek does not appear in Luke chapter 2, verse 7. Doesn't appear there. So Luke does what a lot of good movie writers does. He switches the scene. Right. You, you ever watch a movie? Eh? And you're watching something and then you switch the scene. Before you switch the scene though, Luke does a lot of what a lot of good movie writers and storytellers do is that he hides clues in plain sight. When you see those clues and you understand the clues, the story takes on greater significance. But then he doesn't want to linger too long, so he switches scene. Go on again. Yes, he does. In the same region, verse 8, he has not finished talking about the birth. He's not said anything more than, boy, there's no room. And then he moves back in the same region. What same region? Bethlehem. In Judah. Um, there were some shepherds. He's bringing them in from left field. Why would anybody be interested in shepherds? Oh, shepherds get to come in now with a birth. 
right? Staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. Now, their flock does not necessarily mean that they own the flock. This is what part of what David was alluding to a while ago, right? It just meant that that was a flock that they were responsible for. Yeah, uh, they were hirelings. Yes, they were hirelings. Um, one, two. The idea is that it is likely because of their placement in the city that would have been temper sheep. Mm -hmm. Sheep, sorry. Because others would have had them out in other pastures. But these were those that were going to be used by the temple. And that significantly fits in with how Luke does his story too. Mm -hmm. See? Because here are angels coming to shepherds who do even have sheep. Are, the angels are announcing what? Who is? Right. Who is the Lamb of God, but he's speaking to shepherds who don't own sheep. And shepherds who are not regarded. Because these very shepherds being the keeper of the sheep that would be offered for sacrifice, couldn't go to the temple when sacrifice was being offered. They were considered unclean. So these guys were on the fringe. Yeah, they're like security guards today. And you make anybody come shoot anybody. No, you know, it's true. Like it's how we regard them. <laughs> security guards and gas station attendants. That's how we regard them. And help us. Yeah, they're, 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 they're just low on the totem pole. Yes, yes, that's and what they're, it is. they're not regarded. Not regarded. Right. But there's another reason why I call them security guards. But they were, they were watching over yes. the Yes, but listen to this. You know, there's this big debate about when, what time of the year Jesus was born. Whether he was born in December or whatever. And all kinds of stories. And at another time, we can get into some of the details. But one of the things that they usually, just usually used to say that this could not be December, is that the shepherds are out in the open field and we know that it snows in December. Wrong. Mm -hmm. It snows in December in Europe and North America. In Israel, it rains. And it can be cold. Don't get me wrong. But even if there's snow, where would, I put the where would you put the sheep? Even if it's snowing and raining, where would you put the sheep? Think about it. You have 2,000 sheep. Where do you put them? Inside the house? Some of them can't work. So they don't get to be out in the open. So who's going to look after them in the open? And who you get to do that job? Desperate people who need desperate. Desperate, desperate people money. who need money. <clears throat> so it's the lowest of the lowest who are doing these types of work. My father will call it, call it bola work. Bola work. No, you know? I know some of you yes. the bola slush for food, but that's not the same thing. The same thing, my talk. <laughs> <laughs> so here they were now. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I have never really looked so deep into how low the shepherds, the shepherds were regarded. Yeah. And I remember... David, when um, Samuel went to anoint, oh. Oh. <laughs> when Samuel went to anoint um, one of Jesse's son to be king, and um, it, 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 it hit one more now that the man said, see me seven son them here, and, and um, the man said, no. forget the eight son. Forget the eight son because he was tending the sheep. No, no, is that because he was tending the sheep? Yeah, but that's a good point. I never thought about that. But, but it's it, the least who of, of, to tend the sheep, right? It was, it, was, it was a little boy. Yes, the least. He never have the body. All of those things. It was, they were looking for physical appearance. Remember, that's how Saul was chosen. And yeah. that's what Samuel thought. Uh, and Samuel thought the same thing. That, this must be the one. Yes, the, the boy, look this boy, big and strapping and, and, and look. Yes, I look good. Look like Barry, good looking and, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, but like but, Barry, he was rejected. <laughs> <laughs> No, 
accept that. This Barry is accepted by God and chosen by him. <laughs> so anyway, there he was. Um, so here they are, out on the thing. When suddenly an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. That means that the place just light up. Light up. I don't know what is wrong with this angel. Frighten people and then tell them, don't be afraid. <laughs> <laughs> he, he does it every single time. You know? <laughs> I, am, I am considered he must have just laughed to himself. And sneak out and then when he laughs, he said, don't be frightened. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. He has done so consistent. Don't be afraid. Why? For behold, I bring you good news of great joy for what? All people. You are not left out of this good news. This good news is not for those who are rich, not for those who are powerful. This new, good news is for everybody, including you. Now I need to tell you too that... Um, well, he gives them the good news. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you, which is the good news, the gospel, the good news for you, a savior who is Christ the Lord. Isn't that a, isn't that a redundancy? Christ, Messiah, the Messiah. I'm asking. What's the difference between Christ and Lord? Christ isn't the meaning the anointed. And Lord? My, oh, and Lord? Lord speaks to master, ruler. All right. yeah. Yeah. Um, Christ um, is, is the anointed one, Messiah. Um, Lord speaks to his sovereignty, right to rule. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so, who is born, Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign. There's an assumption the angel is making. What's the assumption? Hmm? Mike. Others can get, you know, why people and other people are not, I'm just lazy he, to get up. He is as, the angel is assuming that them, they have doubts. To no. what he's saying. Mm -mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. What is he assuming? He's giving them a sign. Why? What? Come up, Shanna. Come up, come up, come up. People need to hear you on the, the, the thing. Um, I'm saying that they have heard about him already. Who? The, the, the shepherds that they have heard about the Messiah already. When? I'm, well, you asked what were these. What was the question again? Let me see if I got it right. I'm, I'm saying that the, the angel assumed something when he said, This shall be assigned to you. Yeah, yeah that's what I'm saying. That is what I'm saying. There's an assumption. Of course. Is the angel all knowing? Is the angel all knowing? So, it don't mean to know everything what's going to happen. Him like me? Come. I'm thinking that the sign, because she's, the angel was saying that um, you will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. So, Probably the low, the low, or low, mm -hmm. not that. But it's so simple, that's why I miss it, you know. Okay. <laughs> Is it because the, he knew that they would want to know, they would go looking? That's the point. He's assuming that they're going to go to look. There's, an, there, there's another assumption, Barry. And this will be the sign, he says. Where is it again? Um, verse 12. 
Um, this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Mm -hmm. The assumption is that they will know where to look. That's another thing. So how how them going to know where to look? Is it one manger in Bethlehem? No, you have to talk to the mic, um, baby. Is it that the angel is assuming or he knows that they okay. will go and look? So he said, go and look in the manger instead of assuming. I don't like the word assuming. But which manger? Well, okay. let me hear you. That's, that's the point, baby. He's assuming that they're going to look. He's, assu he's assuming them going to look and I'm assuming them going to know where to go and look. Or oh, yeah. that they're Everybody going to walk to around to every place and look to see if there's a baby wrapped up. They, but they, the likelihood is that all the babies going to get wrapped up is where the baby lying. Not only that, but there, so Barry said something else earlier that might be answered. Yes, go ahead. From what we have read, not necessarily here, um, there was a star shining which no, would have no, stood no, no, over no, no, the place. No, 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 you're mixing up the groups no. You're mixing up two different stories. <laughs> two different stories. Two different story. yeah. But Barry said something earlier. He said that these might have been temple sheep. If they were temple sheep, they would have, been, they would have birthed their lambs in particular places. If there were sheep that were kept for the temple system, they would have birthed their lambs in particular places. And so the shepherd themselves, if they were temple shepherds, temple shepherd, they would have known where to go and look. Okay? These are not... As, as, as Pastor just said, a pastor earlier, these are not just shepherds or shepherd. Is it shepherd or shepherds? Shepherds. Sheep is shepherds. Shepherds can be plural? Okay, great. I didn't know. Yeah, he mentioned that these were, they were rearing sheep for the temple. Okay, so if you're rearing sheep for the temple, the purpose is to have spotless sacrifice. It means that the birth of the lambs had to be carefully orchestrated, what do you call it, mm. overseen. So there would have been a special place for it to happen. Now there's a whole lot more, there's a greater depth into that story. Jesus is born the Holy Lamb of God without spot or blemish. That we could have made that point earlier. I mean, elsewhere. But now what we're saying, what I'm suggesting, is that one of the reasons why the shepherd know where to go is that it's a temple system and they know where it is. They know where to go. Mm. But Luke isn't telling you all of that, you know. No. He's Luke, just just the appetite. Yes. Yeah. Just telling you the story, not getting into the details. He didn't tell you what the shepherds had on. He never tell them nothing else. He just say, this is it. This is it. Yeah. Okay, um, so he, he's assuming that they're going to go and look, and you will find out why in a minute. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, we have to get them to come to church, and saying, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. But before we get into that, um, into that. When, when, when a boy was born, you know, there, there are several other things that you're going to get into over the next, by next week, when we talk about um, the rest of the, the passage here. When a boy was born, um, it was not just an ordinary thing. It was significant that a male child was born. So what would happen is that minstrels would go to his home and they would play music in celebration with the parents for the child being born. There was no home that Jesus was in or place where they would come to play music. But God sends the angels. And the angel comes into town 
and they create a stir. Listen, you think it's not the phone. Um, you have to you have to think about it. When these angels came, when this man come and the light come on, you think it's like a little light that flickered? I mean, when Moses came off of the hill, his, his face shone. It's the glory of God. It's not an ordinary little light. It must have brightened up the entire field and everything that was around it. When the angels came in multitudes, singing and playing, and crying out, glory to God in the highest. Do you think that they whispered and it's just the shepherds who heard? For one moment, do you think all of Judah would have heard? This is not a little quiet thing, you know. It's, it's like some people think now when Jesus come and sound the trumpet, you know, you have to listen keenly. This is, this is, this is a, 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 this is, this is fanfare. This is noise. This is crying out to everybody's attention. How come nobody never wake up and go with the shepherd there to find out what's going on? But we'll talk some more about this next week. We want to thank you for joining us. We see you next week, same time. Um, and, and if, if Brother David managed to change the check, then he will be here next week. <laughs> but God bless. Thank you for joining us. See you on Sunday morning at 8 and at 10. Have a wonderful one day till Sunday. Bless you.